And my sister-in-law, uh, who's a very good friend of mine also, she's a great sister-in-law, you'll actually see a slide of her in my presentation. Uh, she has IBM, and she was unable to come because she has to be very careful, as you all know, about how to use her energy. And she read an article recently, maybe some of you have read this too, about how you should look at your energy like spoons. You have a certain number of spoons that you can use every day, and you have to decide, how am I going to use my spoons? So if you have 10 spoons a day, you have to be very careful with that, right? You have to be really cautious, you have to be discerning about how you're going to spend those spoons. So Susie often tells me things like, you know, it was a 12-spoon day and I'm out of spoons. Um, so I only had 10. So we're actually having a family wedding next weekend and she decided I need to save my spoons for next weekend. So I'll be reporting back to her about anything I learned today. So anyway, I'm a psychologist in Portland, Maine. And I deal with people with the issue I'm talking about all the time. Because every adult in America right now feels overwhelmed, feels like things are out of control, because that's just the way it is. We're living in a, in a world that's going way too fast. So before we get into the talk today, just a couple things. One, feel free to ask questions at any time. And uh, also, I want you to before we go further, just get centered. What I mean by that is I want everyone to just close your eyes if you feel comfortable and just sink into your chair and whatever you have on your mind, you know, you may have things that you're worried about today, things that you want to get done, things that are back home that are left unattended, uh, all kinds of things in your head. Just try to kind of put them on the back burner for now, knowing that all that stuff is still going to be there when you're through today after this, after the conference. And I want you to just approach today's talk with an attitude of, you know, whatever's most important to me will stick. I don't have to try to memorize anything. I don't have to write everything down. But if you have questions, you can always ask me, okay? But just try to look at this as a fun experience where you're just going to take in what you take in and some you may not agree with. Some of what I say, you might say, I'll leave that. And some you might think, yeah, that's a great piece of information. I think I'll take that with me. Okay. So, a little background. This is what American life feels like right now for most of us. It's like a bucket just filled with water that's overflowing all the time. With all of the disruptions we have out there, all the distractions, all the different ideas, most of us have a to-do list that is never ending. Uh, that's just the way it is. I can't tell you how many clients come to me. It doesn't matter what their situation. Adult client cl clients come to me almost every day saying, you know what, I used to be able to do this. I used to have a to-do list, I used to check things off, get things done, I can't do it anymore. It's just getting longer and longer and longer. Well, the news I have for you today is you're all going to die with a long to-do list left unchecked because that's the new norm and the world will somehow go on. It really will. Um, the message we get out there all the time now is that we have to do everything right now. There is no time to wait. There's constant pressure, especially when it comes to being happy, right? There's, there's pressure everywhere. This is an actual book in a bookstore. Happiness Now, Timeless Wisdom for Feeling Good Fast. And this is the kind of thing, I think, as a psychologist, that causes more problems than anything. Most of our depression in America, most of our anxiety, most of our self-doubt, most of our, dis our distress is caused by this kind of message that we get relentlessly every single day. And it's made much worse, of course, when you have something to deal with like a chronic disease, like myositis, because you have extra challenges in your life. And so when you're getting this message everywhere you go, you know, just think of it when you're at the checkout stand at the supermarket. What do all the magazine headlines say? You know, five steps to this, five steps to that. Um, Women's magazines are terrible when it comes to this. You know, I recently saw a headline, five minutes a day to greater happiness forever. Really? I don't think so. So the solution in my mind is we have to look at life now like a funnel. All this stuff coming in, and we have to be very careful, very, very discerning about what we're going to pay attention to, what advice we're going to act on, what the goals are that we're going to set for ourselves. And we have to figure out what's best for us. Okay, that's really the challenge, and that changes daily as new information comes at us, as our internal state changes, as symptoms change. 
with a disease that we might have, like you all do. So we have to take all this in and we have to be discerning and we have to come out with what works best for us. I'm the author of a book called Life Your Way. You'll see it. It's out there at the registration area. And I wrote this book for the reasons that I'm talking about right now, that up until probably about 10 years ago, I didn't see this issue, but increasingly to a point where I know it's epidemic, adults feel like they're going crazy because they have so much stress in their lives. And I thought, you know, there's a real need to teach people some practical steps to having a good life, to dealing with the overwhelm without being over the top about it like so many of these self-help books are today, uh, like I was talking about earlier. So this is my general message today. This is an important thing if you're going to take any, anything home with you from this, that you have to take in all this information and, and funnel out what works for you in terms of the ideas you have, the activities that you're going to participate in. That's the only way that you can maintain some semblance of balance. So four important realities I want to talk about before we go further. Number one is you will never get it all done. It's just not possible. Even the most healthy people, the smartest people with the most help do not get everything done. Because this is the situation we're dealing with. If you're an adult who likes to learn and grow, and all of you are, you wouldn't be here, you're always going to get new ideas. Because the ideas, remember, are relentless. They're coming at you from TV, from the internet, you know, from the blogs you read, from seminars you go to, from all the books you read, and on and on and on, especially from advertising. Because advertising tells us that we have to get this one more thing to be happy. Or we have to do this one more thing, or be this one more thing, if we really want to be important. The message we get in our society is, if you don't constantly do that one more thing, you're just going to get left behind and you're going to miss out. To the point where we actually think in our culture that sleep, that relaxation, that all of that is a waste of time. And I kid you not, there are people that think that working is more important than sleeping. They don't get that in order to be productive, you have to sleep and you have to rest. More on that later. But the fact is, no matter what you do, you're never going to get it all done. Like I said earlier, that to-do list is going to keep on growing. And I want you to look at that as a really positive thing. Because as long as your to-do list grows, that means you are thriving, you're growing, you're learning, you're actively reassessing your life every day and asking, what new interests do I want to take up? What do I want to research? What do I want to do? Who do I want to call? And even if you don't get to it all, it's okay. Reality number two, life will never be perfect. Now you all know this, all of us are adults, we all know this, but it takes constant reminding because we get the message in the media that we can be perfect. Remember, if we just read this one book, if we just attend this seminar, if we read this article, if we do these three steps every day, everything will be totally within our control. Well, guess what? As we learned in the opening talk today, there's no such thing as control. There's really no such thing as balance. There's very few things that we really have any jurisdiction over in our lives. So if you can let go of that need to be perfect, and some of us have that need greater than others, some of us really are perfectionists, if you can lower your standards just a bit, things are going to be okay and you're going to be a lot happier and you're going to feel a lot more in charge. Another reality, and this is essential, you are always in control of your character, your expectations, and your personal rhythm. Now, I've been a psychologist for about 15 years, and I've studied this a lot because this is really one of the most important aspects of being a psychologist, trying to help people develop a sense of competency and confidence and control. And I have come to learn over the years that this is really all we are in charge of. So I'm going to read it again. You are always in control of your character, which is how you respond to things, your expectations, and your personal rhythm. Okay, so this is the basis of everything we're going to talk about today because this right here is the only way you're ever going to feel in control. It's from letting go of all that stuff out there that we have absolutely no control over, like the speed of life today, the amount of information coming at us, the messages we get in the media, what everyone else is doing. We can't control any of it. We're all old enough to know that. But because it's so relentless, it's very hard to accept that. We need to remind ourselves of this. That when you control your character, you know, how you respond to situations, how much integrity you have, 
how you deal with hardship. When you look at your expectations and ask, is this reasonable or not? This expectation I have for myself or for other people. And you challenge those expectations to try to arrive at expectations and related goals that really make sense for you. And when you constantly look at your own pace and ask, is this pace the best for me? Because if you look to the outside world to set that pace for you, you're going to be going in hundreds of different directions with all the messages we get daily. And you're going to wear yourself out. Okay? So going back to that spoon story I told you earlier, it's really about you figuring out what's best for you. And all of us are different. And when you have a chronic illness, that pace changes sometimes throughout the day, sometimes you know, multiple times a week. You have to constantly be asking, I've set this plan for myself today. Do I still have enough spoons? Do I still have enough energy to be able to do this? And when you do that, when you take a step back from everything that's going on around you and you develop that confidence in yourself and the, and the ability to be that assertive and say, you know what, I really wanted to go to that event tonight, but I just can't do it. I need to take a nap. When you get good at doing that, you get healthier, you feel much more in control of things. So those are the realities. Most important, though, is you are not alone. And that's the wonderful thing about coming to a conference like this. You see other people who are dealing with the issues that you have. And I want you to remember what I said earlier. I can't think of one adult I know, clients of mine, personal friends, colleagues, neighbors, people in the community, who do not have this sense of overwhelm right now in our culture. As I said, it's epidemic. Everyone's dealing with it. And yet people come into my office every day saying, you mean, me and other people feel this way? Other people feel like they're constantly dropping the ball, they can't keep up. Wow, maybe I'm not alone. You definitely are not. And, you know, myositis, it's a rare disease. Not a lot of people have it. And so you are apt to feel more alone than others because not only are you dealing with the overwhelm that all adults deal with, but you're dealing with it in the face of this chronic illness that depletes you. So it's so essential to come to conferences like this to share with people and meet with people and hear someone like me talk and know, you know what, oh, there are other people experiencing this. That can help more than anything to give you a sense of control when outside everything which may be spinning out of control. So the woman who talked earlier today at breakfast, she set me up very nicely for my talk because she talked about a lot of, about a lot of things that I'm going to talk about today. And one thing she mentioned was this idea of resilience. You know, we can't control anything. And there's a lot of hype out there and all of the self-help books that just get us more discouraged about how if we just do these three things, we can control these things outside of us, like other people and the fast pace and all of that. I can't say enough that there's just no way to do that. And I can't say enough that it's only going to get faster. The information is only going to multiply. Okay, so what we need to do more than anything to be healthy today as adults is to develop resilience, which is the capacity to deal with stress well, the capacity to be able to deal with hardship in your life, and even though you're going to have down times, to overall have an optimistic view about things, and to know, I can get through this, I have what it takes, I know how to cope with this. And I will say, again, you can't be perfect. So no matter how resilient you are, there are going to be times when you make really big mistakes, when you feel like you can't go one more step, when you feel like nothing's ever going to work out for you, because that's human nature. All of us experience that. Read biographies of any famous person, and you will find anyone you respect has developed resilience through multiple failures, multiple disappointments, frustrations, moments of sheer confusion and hopelessness. So that's all normal. And another really damaging message we get in our culture is that we can live a happy life just by deciding to be happy. We don't have to experience all that disappointment and failure. We can just say, you know what, I'm going to do it this way. I'm in control of my thinking. It doesn't work that way. When you think that way, you just get more depressed and anxious because you're trying to do the impossible. So what the speaker said this morning is certainly true that it's all about how you think, it's all about how you feel, that dictates your behavior, which of course dictates your character and your ability to be resilient. But we can't always control what we think. 
Sometimes thoughts just come into our head, you know, angry thoughts, hateful thoughts. That's normal. I, I used to live in Bangor, and that's where Stephen King lives, of course. And we all know Stephen King, he writes horror. And one of my goals during that year, I lived there when I was getting my training as a psychologist, was I wanted to meet this guy. I thought he would be this creepy, scary kind of person, and I never got to meet him. But what I heard from people who had met him in town was he was the most normal guy they'd ever met. And the theory was that he was in touch with his dark side. Okay, he had these angry thoughts, hateful thoughts, really scary thoughts, and he invited those thoughts. Now, most of us don't do that. Most of us have scary thoughts and we say, I gotta push that away because I've gotta stay productive or I've gotta stay happy. And the truth is, as a psychologist, I know this, that when you allow those discouraging thoughts to surface, your fear is, you know, I'm going to just get swept away and lose control, but actually you'll be more in control. One definition of mental illness is being out of touch with that dark side so that you've pushed it down so much it has to grab your attention in sneaky ways. Okay, we all know what that's like, right? That's like when you're trying to be in a good mood, but you have a lot of stress going on and you're trying to push something down you don't want to think about, and all of a sudden you snap at someone, or you have nightmares, you can't sleep well, you start to get sicker. So to be resilient, you have to invite that dark side in and make friends with it. And we'll talk about that more later. So how do you build resilience? I'm going to give you several tips here. One way is you've got to take excellent care of yourself. Now all of you know what that means. All American adults know what that means because we're inundated every single day with this information. You know, we've got to eat right, we've got to exercise. I don't need to tell you all this. But we all fall off track with this because we get so busy or it's hard to do, right? The things that we need to do to take really good care of ourselves, we toss to the wayside when stressful things come up. So it's a constant practice. None of us really have this down perfectly, you know, unless you're really wealthy and you have a personal trainer and a personal chef and a nanny to take care of the kids, on and on and on. It's very hard to make this a priority. So I say just do the best you can. If you're doing this 70% of the time, you know, eating what you should be eating, doing the exercises you should be doing, seeing your doctor when you need to, all of that, then you're doing pretty darn well. Okay? So just try to keep this as your priority, especially during times when things are really tough. Now I find, and I'm sure you all do, when I have situations going on in my own life, like dealing with my aging mother recently, who had cancer and I was flying to North Carolina from my home in Maine several times over a year and when I would get to North Carolina I would get overwhelmed just dealing with her issues and so I wouldn't stick to my healthy eating I wouldn't stick to my exercise there are times when you're gonna get like that where you know you just can't do it you have to deal with the crisis so be easy on yourself with that now part of taking excellent care of yourself also means Surrounding yourself with people who encourage you, who support you. It's really important to take to stay away from people who drain us. And that's hard to do sometimes because sometimes we can't get away from those people, like people that maybe you have to work with or see at family gatherings. But it's important to learn how to set limits with those people. And we're going to talk more about that too. So taking care of yourself is not just about the basic things we hear regarding food and exercise and going to the doctor. It's also about getting enough sleep. It's about resting enough, taking enough breaks, making sure that you steer clear of people who just drag you down, making sure that you fill your exterior world with things that lift you up. And I will tell you, I learned recently this idea of life balance, which I don't think exists, just like the speaker said earlier today. It's impossible to create balance out there. Life and work are all one thing now because of technology. It used to be, you know, you were at work, then you went home. Now, you know, with all the technology we have, all the ways we have to communicate, when you're at home, you're still having to receive messages from work. Some people don't even take vacation anymore because they're so connected and they feel like they can't stop. Okay, so this idea of life balance doesn't exist. So just throw it right out the window right now. The balance I'm talking about is more an interior kind of balance, which is possible. There will be times uh, internally when you're going to feel out of control, but if you follow my advice, you're going to feel more together more of the time. Um, the idea when I was researching life balance recently, that idea actually came about several hundred years ago, and what it really means is a balance between your interior life and your exterior life. So the goal should be to not try to have this balance, my life is, uh, you know, work is here, um, 
at home it's here, out in the community it's here, just toss that out and try to look at life balance as having a world around you that nourishes you internally. So simple things like making sure to play music that relaxes you, making sure to not watch the news too much if it depresses you, making sure to surround yourself with friends you really enjoy being with. So again, thinking of that funnel, this is about looking at all your options for how you want to build your life and asking, what's going to really encourage my internal balance and what's going to take away from that? And being careful to create a life for yourself where your external situations, whether at home or work or in the community, in your car, everywhere that you are during the day and at night, you have control over those environments, and we'll talk more about that, but having control over those environments so that they really feed your soul. Because that's what keeps you in balance as much as you're going to be. And our world today, we're far too out of directed. Most people don't really even have time for their inner lives anymore, and it's really sad, because that's where resilience actually comes from. It comes from inside of you, not outside, not trying to keep up with everything. Learn to say no is a big part of this, okay? We all know this. Learning to say no from the perspective of, you know, if you have a friend calling saying, you know, I really want to go to a movie with you this Friday, are you free? And if you don't really think you want to go, or you're not sure, say, you know what, I'll get back to you. I don't know right now what my schedule is, but I'll call you before Wednesday. A lot of times, because we're so pressed to make decisions, because things are happening so fast, we just say yes to people just to check something off our list, and then we get into situations we don't want to be in. Now when we're much younger, like I can think back to my 20s, you know, when people would say, hey, you want to go to a party on Saturday night, or, you know, you want to go hang out Sunday afternoon, I'd say, sure, what the heck, I have nothing better to do, I don't really like this group of people, but, you know, who cares, you know. As I've gotten older, and I've started to see people die, like we all do as we get older. I've started to see people get sick. I've developed my own health issues. I realize so much more now that it's essential. I value my time, and I don't waste it doing things I don't want to do. Now, that said, there are things that all of us have to do that we don't want to do, right? I mean, we have to pay our taxes. We have to get along with difficult people, like our next-door neighbor if they're difficult, or you know, relatives that are difficult. We have to take the trash out, we have to do the dishes. So I'm not suggesting that you just say no to everything, but I'm saying step back and ask, what do I really absolutely have to do? Do those things, and what do I really want to do and try to do those things? And let the rest go whenever you can, because that's how you build strength, by focusing on, okay, what is gonna build me up? Even if it's a last minute thing, you know, people have trouble with this, but when you have a chronic illness, Let's say you have plans to do something you really want to do, but you're feeling, I just don't have it in me today. You have to say no, because otherwise you're just going to wear yourself out. So as part of this idea of saying no, I want to define for you what it is to be assertive, because sometimes people think being assertive and saying no is rude, and it's really not. The definition of being assertive and saying no, that's not right for me, is actually about respecting your own rights in a way that respects others as well. So it's not about pushing people away and being obnoxious about it. It's about saying, you know, I really wish I could help you move on Saturday afternoon, but you know what, I just don't have the energy. Is there something else maybe I can help you with next week? Or if you do have the energy, you know, I can't help you all day with your move, but I have a half hour from 10 to 10.30 I could drop by, okay? That's what it means to be assertive. Or if you're dealing with someone, let's say a difficult relative, who really just drives you nuts and they expect you to go to a holiday gathering every year and stay all day. You might say, you know, this year we can't come, I'm very sorry. Or you might say, you know, this year we can only stay an hour, we're really sorry. But saying no is really about designing your life so that it works for you. You have a right to be in charge of how your relationships flow, okay, and how everything else in your life flows. And you absolutely have to learn to do this if you're going to feel that sense of being in charge of yourself and your life, especially when there is a crisis. Reduce your life to what's essential. This is really vital too. All of us have too much stuff in our lives. Not just too much information, but too many things. You know, we live in a consumer-driven culture, a culture that tells us being happy means having more and more and more and more ideas, more and more and more things to read, more and more pieces of clothing, 
more and more and more and more of everything. And most of us know that when we have too much stuff, we just feel stressed, right? We just feel cluttered because that's what this is, having too many ideas in your head, having too many things around you, like having a bedroom where you feel like you, you're constantly under stress because there's too many things around you, like too many things plugged in and flashing, for example. So starting right there, like in your bedroom, ask, is there too much clutter in my bedroom? Maybe I need to put my work desk in another room. Or maybe it's not a really good idea to have a TV in my bedroom anymore. I need to have a sanctuary where I sleep so that I can sleep well. So ask yourself, what in your life do you really need to get rid of to make room for you? To make room for you to just spread out and relax and be calm. And, and this is a constant process. Like, for example, with my closet. You know, I go through my closet once a season and get rid of anything I haven't worn in the past year. And I do this with my best friend because I get emotional, as we all do about things, my possessions. And I think, well, I haven't worn that in two years, but I might wear it again. You know, I really like that. And my best friend will say, it goes. You haven't worn it in a year. It goes to goodwill. Next. And that keeps my closet less compl complicated, right? I mean, I have fewer things. There are always things that I like. It's easier to get dressed in the morning. Do that with everything in your house. Look at everything that you have, every object that you have that you can look at and ask, do I really absolutely need this? And if I don't absolutely need it, is it of such value to me in terms of meaning that I can't let it go? And anything less than that, give it away or sell it or throw it out. And you'll find that you feel a lot more in command of things. And the same goes for your ideas. Getting back to the idea we heard this morning about your thinking. All of us have ideas we've been carrying around for a long time that don't serve us. You know, like I have to do it all, for example. I have to be perfect. Or if I don't keep up with everyone else, I'm going to get lost. I'm going to lose out. Those ideas, all they do is cause stress. So examine those ideas. And if you find that you have ideas that don't work for you or goals that are too big and only causing you discouragement, Knowing that it's hard to change your thinking, it's one of the hardest things you can do because you've had these thoughts in your head for a long time. Maybe go see a therapist to, have to get their help. That's essentially what therapists do. They meet with people regularly, if you've ever been to one, you know this, to help change thinking so that you can in turn change your emotions and change your behavior and improve your life. Practice grounding rituals. One way that you can really feel centered, especially during times when you feel like you're out of control, like things are just going crazy around you, is to do something that simply has become habit, a good habit that keeps you grounded. For example, meditation. Now, I'm not a big meditator. I listen sometimes to meditation tapes before I go to sleep. I do that probably three times a week, and that really helps me. That's a routine that helps me to relax so that when I get in bed, my mind knows, okay, it's time to wind down now. As opposed to maybe doing something like watching the news on a TV in a bedroom, which only gets you all worked up, right? So there's all kinds of grounding rituals that you can do to feel balanced. Uh, going to a place of worship regularly, going for a walk three times a week out in nature. Nature is one of the most calming things there is, the most centering, grounding things. Lots of studies have been done on nature recently to show that one of the best ways that you can boost your mood and feel more calm and in command is by taking walks in nature, or just being in nature, or just being quiet. So think about rituals in your life. Think about maybe adding some rituals. Also think maybe about letting go of rituals that don't work for you, like maybe something that you always did growing up that you've tried to continue that is just stressful, like maybe you know having everyone over for Thanksgiving, and it's just gotten to be too much work. Start a new tradition. It's okay to do that. Tradition is really good, but only if it works for you. So again, we're taking a lot of things into the funnel here and asking, okay, I'm putting all this in and I'm going to take out only what suits me. But the message here is that when you have a grounding ritual, what happens is you get into that frame of thought of, okay, it's time to relax now. If your mind is ready to do that because it's been doing it you know, once a week for so long or every morning for so long, just like brushing your teeth. You know, it's something that you don't think about because it's just a habit. It's just something you do. You don't have to psych yourself up. Okay, I'm going to brush my teeth now. 
You've been doing it so long, it's just part of who you are. And that's what happens when you do rituals to ground you. It doesn't become hard work after a while because it's an ingrained habit. Now that said, having too many rituals is a problem. So if you find that there are too many things you're trying to do to stay calm and stay relaxed and feel in control, try to winnow it down just to things that really do help you. Um, you know, for me, what I love to do more than anything is be in water. That grounds me. So I make sure, above all else, to swim on a regular basis. I absolutely need to do that. There's other things I like to do that I simply don't have time for. So my two grounding rituals in terms of exercise are yoga and swimming. And sometimes I do other things, like tennis. I like tennis, but I don't have a lot of time to work that in. So we can't do everything we want to do, either because we don't have time or we don't have the energy. So just be careful about what you choose as your rituals to ground you. Very important piece of advice here. Include falling off track and falling apart as part of your plan. Now, increasingly what I've noticed in our culture is that we have this idea more and more that if we just create a plan for ourselves, it can happen. There's a lot of hype out there right now about retirement, about not having just an everyday, ordinary retirement anymore. It used to be, you know, everyone wanted to work at the same company, get a gold watch after 30 years, move to Florida, and play cards. Okay, that's what people used to strive for. Not so much anymore, and that's a good thing. We've realized a lot of us that playing cards is kind of boring. Or a lot of us never even went to Florida to relax, and then we thought, you know, oh, I'm going to love going to Florida, and then we realized I don't even like Florida. A lot of people move back from Florida after they retire. So what's happened with retirement, just like with a lot of other situations in a world where there's so many options, is we've realized now that the world is our oyster with retirement. We can do just about anything if we plan for it. But there's a catch to that, okay? Some things maybe you can't afford to do. Some things maybe you don't want to do. And the other part of that is just because you plan it doesn't mean it's going to work out. I read something yesterday about how the average retirement person, a person who saves for a long time for retirement, they work really hard with this big dream for retiring and having this perfect life of recreation, the average amount of years someone lives after that is three years because they've exhausted themselves in the process of saving for retirement and anticipating retirement. So the point here is that you can have a plan, but we all know that plans don't always work. You know, I um, had a father who died five years ago from Parkinson's disease. He was a totally organized man. He had a great retirement planned out for himself, but he never got to enjoy it because while he was still working in his mid-50s, he got Parkinson's and it was a horrible um, case of Parkinson's and he spent the last five years of his life in a nursing home with all his money gone from treatment. That happens to a lot of people. Now that's an extreme case, but whatever plan you're trying to make, even if you plan really, really well, let's say you're going to a life coach and you're saying, I want to plan the next five years of my life and I'm going to make it great. That's a wonderful thing to do as long as you leave room for things to change, for you to fall off track, because you will fall off track. You will get maybe a different idea, something you're more interested in, and say, you know what, I no longer want to go to grad school, or I no longer want to have this as a hobby, or I'm not really happy in this marriage anymore. When you live in a world where there's constantly choices and ideas, and you're a person who's smart and likes to be stimulated and creative, sometimes you're going to change your plans from inside of you, and sometimes something outside of you will happen. And a diagnosis with a chronic illness is a perfect example of that, right? You have a plan, and all of a sudden, it's not going to work because you've got to take care of yourself even more than you ever thought. And then you've got the disease, and you think you're doing fine, and all of a sudden, you're going down a path of darkness with it because it's gotten much worse. So it's really important to know, more than ever in our culture, that we cannot control whether or not our life plan is going to go as planned. And when you go into a plan knowing that, and you expect there are going to be interruptions, there will be failures, there will be disappointments, or maybe I'll even get a better idea. There will be changes that I'm excited about. You know, like maybe I'm planning to have a summer home and then want this one location, or I'm saving money for that, and I get a much better idea. That will happen too. But again, internal things will happen. You know, you'll lose interest, or you'll get sicker or you'll feel better, right? Or you'll just change your mind about something. 
Maybe you read a book on something and all of a sudden that sends you down a whole new path. So it used to be, we're old enough to know this, that we thought adult development was linear, right? You did certain things, just like a child's development is pretty linear. You know, every three-year-old child is pretty much doing the same thing. Every five-year-old, 10-year-old, 15-year-old, they're pretty much at the same place. And it used to be that way with adulthood. And the idea was you would graduate from high school, some of us went on to college, some did, but shortly after that you would you know, choose a career, and you would get married, you'd buy a house, you'd stay in the house, raise your kids, and it would all be one long line, but that doesn't happen anymore for a variety of reasons. And the biggest reason is that there's just not that much stability anymore in our culture. The average amount of time an adult stays in a job now is about three years. Infants born this year, studies say, will have, by the time they die, 11 distinct careers because things are changing so quickly. So when I was growing up in the 70s, when my parents would hear about people who got divorced or people who were switching careers and going back to school, that would be framed as, oh, that person can't stick with a commitment. That person um, is wishy-washy. You know, that person comes from a broken home. Nowadays, we embrace that, which is a really wonderful thing because people are able to be who they want to be. People in their 50s and 60s and 70s now are saying, you know what, I'm not happy living with this partner anymore. I'm not happy with this career. I'm going back to school. I'm not happy living in this state. I want to live in a cooler climate. Whatever. It's okay now. But you have to realize that anything can happen, including falling apart. And this is essential for all of us to pay attention to. Because when you have a lot of hardship, as we all do as adults, especially when you have myositis, you're going to feel sometimes hopeless. You're going to feel like, I can't do this anymore. There's no hope for me. I feel helpless. All of that. And it's normal. And you're going to fall apart. If you're a care partner, I'm going to start using that term, by the way. I used to say caregiver, but I love that term I learned this morning. If you're a care partner, there's going to be times when you're really angry at your partner who's sick because they're ruining things, right? I mean, you had all these great plans and now they're sick and you have to slow down and all your money's going into treatment, on and on and on. There's going to be some dark moments. There's going to be fights, okay? There's going to be tears. There's going to be sometimes throwing things. And that doesn't mean that you're completely going to unravel. It just means that sometimes life gets to be a bit much. And if you can accept that, as part of being resilient, you're going to do much better because when it happens, you won't say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I got angry at the person I loved yesterday. What is wrong with me? Or I can't believe I actually yelled or I actually started sobbing for no reason in the middle of the day. It's okay. It's normal. We have to have outlets. We have to be able to express our emotions. And dealing with myositis, just like any other illness that's chronic, is really hard work. Okay, so allow yourself. Give yourself a break when you have a plan. We all need plans. We all need to have goals. But when that doesn't work out, or when you just feel like, I can't do it anymore. When you allow yourself to fall apart, you'll get back on track. When you don't allow yourself to fall apart, things get worse. Because like I said earlier, when you suppress difficult emotions, they come up and they grab you in really sneaky ways, and then you really get out of control. Recognize that emotional distress is normal, especially in the midst of intense hardship. And I want to emphasize this. We just talked about it, but it's important to emphasize that it's perfectly normal to have really distressing emotions. Our culture has absolutely no patience for distress. You turn on the TV any time of day, you're going to see advertisements over and over again for antidepressants. You know, you're feeling down pop a pill because we have what we need now. We can control our mood. We can always feel good. If you feel bad, if you feel angry, you feel depressed, then you are a loser. You're a failure. Not true at all. We live in a culture where I have had clients come to me and say things to me like, I don't prescribe because I'm a psychologist, but they'll say things to me like, you know, I work really hard. My father just died. We're really close. I'm devastated. I don't have time to take off from work. So I need you to send me to a psychiatrist so I can get an antidepressant because I need to keep working. I don't have time for these emotions. And I'll say to those people, and some of them get irritated, absolutely not, because that's a normal emotion. And if you don't deal with that emotion and move through it, you'll never recover 
and you may feel like you're recovering, but it will come back to haunt you later. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. There was a study done over the past uh, 10 years or so um, by a researcher on the wives of husbands who had died in the 9-11 tragedy. He, he found this town outside of New York where several women had lost their husbands, and he noticed that there was two groups from that larger group of women. And one group in the beginning, they were just amazing. People were just in awe because these women lost their husbands, they kept on working, they seemed so incredibly strong. And there was another group that totally fell apart. They had to leave their jobs, some of them ended up in psychiatric units, really big problems with their kids, they were drinking, some of them got into drug use, really bad stuff, okay? What do you think happened when he went back 10 years later? Any ideas? It had flipped, right? So these women that seemed so resilient because they didn't miss a beat, they just kept right on doing what they'd always done, they weren't dealing with the grief. So it came back in, in lots of sneaky ways. So in 10 years, a lot of them were out of work, they had serious drug addiction, alcohol problems, they were in really bad second marriages, their kids had problems, whereas the other group had moved through the grief and they were doing really, really well. Okay, so that's just a story to illustrate why it's so important to recognize emotional distress as a really healthy thing. Now that said, if you find that you are depressed, okay, for a long time and you just can't shake it, you know, that's real clinical depression. Or if you find that you're anxious no matter what you do and it's really interfering with your life, get help. Okay, I'm talking about ups and downs that we all go through, but if you really feel, you know, you're stuck, for a long period of time from your emotional distress. The way that psychologists define mental illness is that your distress is getting in the way of you living a normal life. So you can't do the things that you normally do. It gets in the way of your relationships, your health, your work. So when you feel that's happening to you, it's time to reach out to a, a counselor or to a pastor or to a psychologist or psychiatrist or your, your primary care physician and just say, you know what, I've had this mood for a long time, no matter what I do, I can't shake it. And that's really the, the biggest way that you know if you're suffering from depression or anxiety is nothing helps. So if you're just in a bad mood, a friend might say, let's go to our favorite restaurant. By the end of the meal, you've forgotten what you were upset about. With depression, you can do all your favorite things. Watch the funniest movies and entertain yourself in the best ways you know and it's still there. That's depression. Nothing can penetrate it. Learn to stop thinking in extremes. It's not good or all bad. Win or lose, succeed or fail, it's just life. Now something else that's wrong with our culture is that we tend to do this. We tend to look at the world in black and white, right? The haves, the have-nots, um, succeed, fail, all the rest of it. Good mood, bad mood. And so what we do as adults in this culture is we tend to try to stay on the good side of all that. Like, I want to be a winner, I want to be in a good mood all the time, I want to be successful all the time. And, you know, this dichotomy of good, bad, win, lose, all of that, it's just something we've made up. It's not real. That's not how life is. Life is really all of this stuff. As I said earlier, there is no life balance. That's just another dichotomy that sets us up for failure. You know, just to think that, okay, I can have this balanced life where my work is over here, and my community is over here, and this is over here. You can't do that. And, and that just makes us crazy. So to look at life is just life. You know, some days you have a good day, some days it's not so good, some days you feel on top of things, some days you feel confident, sometimes you feel like everything in your life is just a great big mess. That's the way it is. Sometimes we can have ups and downs all day long, right, if it's a really bad day. Uh, so if you can get used to that and look at your mood more as a climate rather than the weather. And what I mean by that is, let's say you went to Florida for spring break and you wanted to have a fun time on the beach and it just happened to rain every day. Just a fluke. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden Florida is a rainy place. It just rained that week. Yet what we do as adults is we say if we're in a bad mood or having a really frustrating time for a couple weeks, that means my whole life is going down the drain. No, it just means you're having a bad couple of weeks. So all of these suggestions I'm giving you, like I said earlier, if you can do them like 70% of the time, you're doing really, really well because life is hard. You know, it's easy when you're sitting in a room like this and feeling really pumped up and you have no distractions whatsoever. 
um, to say, yeah, this advice is really great. My life is going to be fabulous when I leave here. As soon as we all walk out that door, life is happening again. New demands are coming at us, you know? So it's just life. You have to look at this as a practice. You're just going to try every day to do the best you can with what you have. And sometimes you're going to screw up, and sometimes you're going to get bad news, and sometimes you're going to get angry and all the rest of it. That's just life. Read biographies of people you respect and adopt their coping strategies. This is really a great way, I think, to learn to be resilient. It's something I do all the time. If you have people you really respect in the world, people you think have a lot of character and integrity and have accomplished things that really inspire you, read their biographies and you will learn that they failed multiple times and that they had some really dark periods in their life because it happens to every human being. And the only way that people become extraordinary leaders is by becoming resilient and looking at failures as opportunities to learn and grow. You know, so if you screw up, let's say you say, you know, I think I have enough energy tonight. I think I'm feeling good enough to go to that party. And the next day you're sick and you're just completely wiped out and in a bad mood. Instead of saying, well, I, I totally screwed up yesterday. I say, well, I learned something yesterday. Maybe the next time I go to a party, I'll stay a little less time. You know, or maybe the next time I go to a party, I won't drink, I'll just drink club soda. Whatever it is, take that information and learn from it. What a lot of really successful people do, I think what they all have in common, is every day before they go to sleep, they evaluate how the day went. Not in a really critical way, but just saying, well, this went well, that went well. What do I want to take into tomorrow? What might I want to change? So let's say you're an executive and you're evaluating how the day went and someone told you, you know, you really didn't do a very good job of running that meeting today. It went on too long. And that big mouth took up a lot of the time, blah, blah, blah. You might say, you know what, I really didn't do a good job of running that meeting. I'm going to make some changes when I have a meeting tomorrow. But other things did go well. Sometimes you're going to get feedback that doesn't really fit you. And you can say, you know what, I've considered that feedback, but I don't think that person was really right, so I'm not going to pay attention to that. And, you know, I try to do that every day, and it really does help me to go to sleep with a clear head. And I have learned over the years that it really is true. You know, I fail multiple times. I make all sorts of mistakes, but I have a difficult career. So who would make mistakes? You know, I, I see all sorts of clients with all kinds of different issues. Sometimes people get upset with me. Um, I have a, a multiple writing projects I'm working on a month. I do all kinds of speaking engagements. I'm bound to make mistakes. Things are bound to go wrong. And I try to learn from those things. And sometimes it's really not easy. So read biographies and see what you can learn. Now I'm going to talk about some ways that you can find calm in the storm. So when things around you are really feeling just crazy and you feel like even some of the suggestions I gave you aren't really working and you don't know how you're going to feel better again, uh, that's what we're going to talk about next. And I want to point out that this is my sister-in-law who has IBM. Her name is Susie. And she's a really remarkably positive person. And she loves to be in water. Being in water makes her feel really good no matter what's happening around her. And her partner took this picture of her when they were on vacation in Canada a couple of years ago. And I love this picture of her because that's really Susie. You know, that's how Susie lives. She has bad moments, you know, when she really gets upset. But... Um, for the most part, she just tries to, as she says, be like water, you know, just relax into the water and trust that things are going to be okay. So she knows how to find calm in the storm, but I know as her sister-in-law and close friends, a lot of times she just gets so discouraged and she has some really bad days, but uh, she is very resilient. So the first suggestion I have for you when you're really feeling overwhelmed and like things are just really bad and you don't know what to do, and you really feel out of control, is try to get quiet. Try to just say, okay, I've got to step away from the cacophony of everything that's going on, and just sit with myself and feel what comes up. Now, the way that I run my practice is I try to get people in touch with their inner voice, because I think when you're looking at that funnel I talked about, the best way to know what to keep from everything that goes in is to ask your intuition what's right for me. And... A lot of men say, well, men don't have intuition. I think that's wrong. that's wrong because I have dealt with a lot of men who say they have intuition. And it's actually a very simple thing. It's just a feeling that you have, a gut feeling that says, that's right for me and that's not right for me. And sometimes it doesn't make sense to anyone else. We all know that feeling. You know, the feeling you have when you're looking at a house and it, on paper it sounds like a great house. It just doesn't feel right. Or you're on a date and it 
you know, this person's perfectly nice, but there's just not, not a connection there. There's not that right fit. So listen to that intuitive message that we have about everything, especially when you are in some kind of a crisis. If you can get quiet and just sit with it, because uh, a lot of times when you're in crisis, we feel the need to act quickly. And we're designed to do that. There was some talk of that this morning, you know, about how we're wired to deal with anxiety because we once lived out in the wild. So if a signal went off inside of us, like there's a dangerous animal coming at you, we had to figure out what to do. And it's usually the flight or, or fight uh, response, right? So you either run away from something you can't possibly deal with or you fight it. And you fight it in a way where you know that you can win the battle. Uh, and we do that too much. You know, that early wiring doesn't really work in our, our culture. We don't really run into those kinds of situations much anymore unless you know, you're on a dark street in the, the middle of the night in a city and you see someone suspicious walking toward you. We're not often out in the wild, but yet that wiring uh, still goes off. Like every time we hear a beep coming from our cell phone, for example, or our computer, um, there's something about us where we, we take that signal as that's something really important going on. We go into that mode of, I've got to act right now. It could be essential. You know, that's why when you're at Walmart, you see women digging in their purses when their phone's ringing, you know, as if their life depended on it. Hi, what are you doing? I'm at Walmart. What are you doing? You know, it doesn't matter. But people who are addicted to our technology, okay? Studies have shown that even if you're a perfectly responsible person, like I think all of us are, like I certainly am, if you have your cell phone in your car, and it's right next to you, even if you know no one important is going to call you, and it's a really stupid thing to be talking on the phone in the car, it's almost impossible not to even, not to just look at it, almost impossible not to pick it up, because that's how we're wired to respond to signals. So, what I tell people to do, and what I do myself, is turn your phone off, put it in the back seat, so you will not be exposed to that temptation. So, Get quiet, okay? It's hard to do because we are so reactive most of the time, and that's where all our mistakes come from, by the way, from thinking, oh, I'm, I'm doing things so quickly, making all these decisions. When you're in crisis, the most important thing to do is get away from all of that noise and just sit still and ask really quietly, what can I do? And don't ask questions like, what can I do to resolve this crisis? Come on, come on, I need an answer. It's more like, what can I do just to get a little calmer right now so I can try to think of a solution? So when I'm in that kind of mode, what comes to me, things like have a glass of water, or go pet the dog, okay, or go read that book that helped you so much last time, or go call your best friend. I don't get big, huge headlines, you know, like solve the problem by following these three steps, because that's not reality. That's all marketing. So get quiet and just ask, what small action can I take? I had a client recently who was in crisis, who has a chronic illness, and she said, the only message I got was just go wash your face with cool water. That's all I could do. And so I did that, and then I asked, what next? And the only message I got was just, just lie down. And by the way, lying down is something we don't do very often as a culture. We used to do that. You know, I remember when I was growing up in the 70s, if my mother was feeling overwhelmed, she would just go lie down for 20 minutes. Not many people do that anymore, because that's looked at, again, as a waste of time. But sometimes just lying down just closing your eyes is all you need to get to the next step. And usually your intuition will tell you what that is. And sometimes, like I said, it's a very simple thing. Don't ask for huge answers, but if you go step by step with your intuition, it'll get you there. And I'll tell you a little story about that before I move on. I constantly am talking about intuition. I had a client come in one day. He was in crisis in his personal life because he was engaged to be married. He was getting married in a month. He wasn't sure it was the right woman for him. And I was trying to talk to him about what is the gut feeling you have, you didn't get it. I work across the street from Starbucks, which I, I must tell you is a very dangerous place to work because I'm constantly going over there. Um, but this guy had a huge coffee drink, you know, with all this whipped cream on top. And, and a lot of my clients will bring drinks in with them. And I, I was getting a little frustrated trying to explain to him what intuitive messages are. And I said, well, that drink, why did you get it? And he said, well, I don't know, I was just on my way over here. And, thought just came to me that I'd like to have this, that it would feel good. I said, exactly. That's what your intuition does. It will just tell you, you know, whether it's, you know, I really should have this cereal this morning instead of that same old cereal I always have. Your intuition will tell you what's best for you. And the more you listen to it, even if it doesn't make sense, 
the more on track you will feel, the more grounded you will feel. So make room in your life. When I was talking about those rituals, make room in your life on a regular basis, not just in crisis, to get quiet and, and go inside and ask, intuition, do you have anything to tell me today? And you'll find that you have a better relationship with yourself, you'll be happier, and you'll feel much more confident and in charge. So when things are out of control, another thing to do is to look at the big picture and look for wake-up calls and lessons. A lot of times when things are really out of control, there's a message in that that's really important for us. And I find a lot of times the message is you're moving way too fast. How many of us have ended up in a situation where we're really sick all of a sudden and we really think about it and we realize you know, I was trying to do too much or I was really pushing for something that wasn't right. How many times have we been disappointed, like not gotten the job we wanted or not gotten the second date we wanted or not gotten the house we really, really, really desperately wanted and realized in the end, you know what, it wasn't right for me and had something better come along. So try to look at the big picture like that. One great thing about being adults for all of us is that we've had enough life experiences now to know that this often happens. When something doesn't go right, it's because there's a better solution down the road, a better fit down the road, something that fits you better. So think about that. You know, I used to counsel college students, and what I noted about college students, a lot of them would come in and they would be in total crisis. And it would always be something where I was thinking internally, oh, come on, this is ridiculous. But of course, I wouldn't tell them that. Like, their first breakup. They were never going to meet anyone again. Life was over. They'd failed the test. They would never, ever graduate or get a job. Because those things had never happened to them before, right? So I had to be very patient with them and say, you know, there will be hope. And they don't have our perspective. We all had failed enough and had enough things to not work out to know that there usually is something better down the road. So remember that and look for the wake up calls. Look for those lessons because there often is lessons. There often is a lesson in crisis. Focus on what's certain. And I'm going to show you an exercise now to help with this. But what typically happens when we're in crisis is that we immediately forget about what we do have. We immediately go to everything is falling apart. Worst case scenario, you know, we get on this runaway train, you know, maybe we have a financial crisis and all of a sudden we're going to end up on the street. Or we have a health crisis, all of a sudden our life is over. Uh, I deal all the time with this, of course. Um, like somebody might come in and say, I was just diagnosed with cancer. Um, I have to go in for treatment. I'm a wreck. My life is over. I'm going to be terminal, you know, even though the doctor hasn't said that. And so I'm often in a situation where I'm helping to people, people to really get clear what's actually happening, to get out of that place of reaction and get to a place of realizing not everything is out of control. So let me show you now um, this exercise that will help with that. And you can do this anytime. I call this the circle of certainty. So whenever you're feeling a little out of control, just make a circle like this and you put on the inside everything that is certain in your life despite what's happening, okay? So one thing you might say is, you know, I still have my best friend to talk to. I'm still breathing. I still have my home. I have coping skills. I have this great book that I've been reading that helps with this. I have my journal to write in, which by the way is an excellent coping strategy to just get your thoughts out. So you get the point. Um, you know, putting names of people in the circle you know you can count on. People who are always there for you, okay? But especially putting in the circle what you know about yourself. You know, I've been through this before. I know it's certain that I can deal with this, whatever happens, okay? And look at that circle again and again. There's something about writing down things that makes them more true. I find that one source of stress is when you don't get things out of your head. And I also find that when you write things down, it's more apt to happen. So I have my clients who are in distress make this circle of certainty and pull it out several times a day and look at it. Because that message really does go in. You know, yes, it's not all bad. I do have all these things that I can count on. I'm going to be okay. 
Make your basic needs your primary concern. The first thing you should do when you're in crisis is remember that what's most important is that you are getting your primary needs met above all else. Making sure you're drinking enough water, making sure you're taking your medication, making sure that you're eating enough, okay? Because these are the things that we tend to lose sight of when we're in crisis. Even if you don't feel like eating or drinking water, make sure you're doing it. Making sure if there are people in your life that you really rely on for support, that you're in touch with those people. Do not isolate. That's one of the worst things that we do when we're in crisis. We get so overwhelmed and we think no one's going to understand. I don't want to bother that person. Whatever the reason, we disconnect from people. Now, that said, it's good to disconnect sometimes. You know, when you just don't feel like dealing with something, you know, it's good every now and then to say, you know, I just can't deal with the world. I'm going to cancel all my plans. I'm just going to watch silly movies or or just uh, sleep today or, or whatever. But when you're doing that regularly at times of crisis, that's just going to make you worse off. So whatever your basic needs are, you know what they are. You know what you have to, to have to feel okay. Make sure you're doing those things. And if you can't do those things because you're too stressed, make sure you get the help to do them. Do only what you have to do until you're in the clear. This is really important. We've been talking about this a lot today already. That it's essential that you only do what you really want to do or what you really love to do, what's really going to serve you. But you have to do that a notch better when you're in crisis because you're going to have to probably cut out even more. If you're feeling overwhelmed and feeling totally depleted and like you can only handle the crisis at hand, it's a real priority shift. So you're going to have to take a look at your schedule and say, okay, I really wanted to do this today, but I just don't have the energy. I don't have enough spoons today. I can't do it. Okay? Um, so whatever you can just put on hold, whatever you can let go of that doesn't absolutely have to happen, you know, when it comes down to it, the, the really important things are probably about you, your basic needs, the basic needs of your family members, uh, but other things usually you can let go of, um, even if it seems pressing at the time. So you know what that is, but whatever it is that you know is just going to add more stress, just try to let it go until you've got things more uh, under control. Practice balanced escapism. Now our culture, another cultural problem, our culture tells us if we have a problem, escapism is the answer. And we advocate this as a culture in ways that are very destructive. You know, like you should just go shopping all the time if, if you don't want to deal with something, or just drink, or just work all the time, or eat too much. Messages are everywhere to escape the problem at hand. Now, getting back to this idea of it's not all good, all bad, if you're constantly shopping to feel better, you're going to have a problem, right? If you're constantly drinking alcohol or doing drugs to numb yourself, you've got a problem. Or if you're, you know, having indiscriminate sex or working way too much, that's a problem. But balanced escapism is very important. There's a reason why we have restaurants, why we have bars, why we have movies. Because we need to get away sometimes. So make sure that you're allowing yourself that. So if you feel like, you know, this has been a horrible week, everything's out of control, I've had a lot of bad news, I just need to go out for a couple martinis tonight. I think that's okay if you're not an alcoholic. Or if you say, you know what, I, I am so overwhelmed right now and I've been on this really good diet, I just want to go out and have an ice cream sundae right now. It's okay if you're not doing that on a regular basis, so allow yourself that. Because what happens if we don't allow ourselves those outlets sometimes, those fun kind of crazy things to do, um, you'll start to break down and you'll rebel. Any of you, and there are probably a lot of you who, like me, have tried diets that are very, very restrictive. I don't do those diets anymore because I always end up rebelling because I get so angry about how much I'm depriving myself. And it's the same with escapism. If you're not allowing yourself to just check out every now and then and say, I'm not going to think about the problem tonight. I'm just going to go see that adventure movie or I'm just going to go see a play, or I'm going to hang, go hang out with my friends and play pool. Whatever it is, let yourself do this, as long as you're not getting into trouble by doing too much of it. Turn it over to something greater. Now, this is another important one, and this could be a very complicated uh, concept, because we can get into religion when we talk about this, but that's not what I'm talking about, really. I mean, I might be. It could be about religion. But... The bottom line of everything we're talking about is that when you can try to control, when you try to control everything, you lose control more. 
So as a basic example, if you have a job interview and you're just worried to death about it and you can't sleep the night before, you're not going to have a very good interview. But if you focus on, okay, I'm just going to do what I need to do, I'm going to practice some interview questions, I'm going to have a nice outfit and make sure it's ready to go the night before, I'm going to learn as much as I can about the company where I'm interviewing, I'm going to try to think positive thoughts, I'm going to leave a little early, make sure I have the directions, do all those things you're in charge of, you'll probably do better. Because there's some of the things that you might be worried about that are just going to cause problems, right? If you're worried, what if they don't like me? Or what if there's other people that are better than me? That doesn't help get you anywhere. So what I've learned is whether you're a religious person and you believe God's taking care of it or Allah's taking care of it, or whether you're an atheist who believes nobody's taking care of it, when you are anxious and stressing and obsessed about these things and trying to control everything, whether someone is going to take care of it in your mind or not, it doesn't work out. So you might as well just not try to control it. So I have come up with a way that really helps me and, and helps my clients, and I want to tell you about it, because it really helps you to turn over things you can't control to. It could be God, like I said, it could be Allah. I say it's the universe. And I also say that it's the manager. That's what I like to call it. I think of sometimes things that I have no control over that are worried me, that I can't do anything about, and I say, you know what, my manager, which is this imaginary person, my manager will take care of this, and I'll focus on what I can do. So, as an example of how I do this, and I highly recommend that you all do it, I create on a piece of paper two sides, and on this side I say the manager, and this side I say, this is me. So this is my responsibilities, this is the manager, okay? I'm going to give you an example. I live in Maine, as you know, and it's, we have horrible winters there. Beautiful summers, but really bad snowy winters. And I do not like to drive in the snow. So when I'm at work sometimes, which is a half hour from my house, I hear there's a storm coming, I have to get home, and I get really anxious. So I have to do this. So looking at the me part, if I'm trying to be less anxious as I'm driving through snow to get home, what are some of the things I can do to make sure that situation goes better? Any ideas? Yes, drive carefully. What else can I do to make sure that... Tires. Yes, check the tires. Have good tires. What else? Yes. Oh, yes, that's a good one. Right. Some other ones I might, um, you know, have relaxing music on. Go below speed limit. Okay, so you're getting the point. Now, in the manager part, the things that I usually worry about, you know, what if someone, um, what if a big truck goes by and splashes snow in my windshield and I can't see and I go off the road? What if there's black ice? What if there's crazy drivers out there? On and on, I can't control any of that. So what am I going to put the manager in charge of? Yeah, so the manager is in charge of making sure the other drivers drive safely. What else can the manager do? Yes. The other thing the manager could do is keep me calm. Because I have no real control over that. You know, there's, there's no way that any of us can say, you know, I'm going to reduce my anxiety level. It's just not possible. We can do sort of a sort of few things to sort of help with that, to influence that, but we can't. When we're anxious and we're feeling out of control, just say, I'm going to calm myself down right now. So it's important to put that out there. And I do this for a lot of things with a lot of my clients. Another example might be when I have a client come in who's really worried because her kid has turned 16 and they're taking the car out on their own. You know, that, that causes parents a lot of anxiety, as many of you probably know. So I do this with them. I do this with people about all kinds of things, like maybe how I... A medical test is going to turn out. They have to go through a week of waiting. What can't they control? What can they do to try to calm down during that week of waiting? What can they do when the diagnosis that they have gets worse? There's all kinds of ways that you can work this. 
uh, for yourself, and I encourage you to do this in your own lives. Um, you can do it with just about anything. Anything that's making you feel like you're anxious and you're trying to control things you know you have more, you have no control over. Because again, the bottom line here is that we really can't control most of the things in our, in our world. And when we focus on what we can, you know, like when I focus on all these things when I'm driving, I feel much better and I am actually driving more safely. When I'm worried about all of this stuff, I'm really a mess when I'm driving. And I probably shouldn't even be on the road. So, as I said before, when you write things down, it really does help. There's something about getting it out on paper. And I advocate this, not just for the exercise that we're talking about here, and the other one I showed you, but any time that you're feeling really, really stressed, if you have time and you're not driving, just get out a piece of paper and just dump whatever you're thinking, whatever you're afraid of, just dump it onto the piece of paper and just throw it away. There's a process that you might, some of you want to try, it's called morning pages. And the idea with morning pages is that every morning when you get up, you do what I just talked about, you have a piece of paper and you just dump onto the paper anything that comes up. It's like vacuuming your mind up. So any worries, um, any anxiety about what the day might bring, um, good thoughts, bad thoughts, anything. And then you just toss it in the garbage. It's just a really nice way to free your mind. And what I found happens with that process, when you do that regularly, it's kind of like when you turn on a garden hose in the spring and dead leaves come out and then clear water comes out. When you do that on a regular basis, you just start to get all that gunk out off of your mind and you start to think more positively and just a whole lot more clearly about things. So whenever you can write things down, I think it's very useful. Write and say affirmation statements. This is another one. Um, anyone familiar with the idea of affirmations? Affirmation statements. It's about improving your outlook by repeating to yourself statements related to goals that you want to have happen as if those goals had already happened. So instead of saying, for example, let's say I want to save $500 and I'm not very good with money. So instead of me saying, I hope I can save $500 or I intend to save $500, I'll do my best, I might say to myself as I'm trying to save the money over the course of time, every day, several times a day, I have $500 in the bank. That's a lot more empowering, isn't it? Because it's not like, well, maybe I'll do it, but I'm not really sure. It's, I've already done it. Now, we can do an affirmation for just about anything, okay? So let's say you're starting a, a walking routine and you don't really like to walk. Instead of saying, I'm going to try to walk three times this week, you might say, I'm walking 20 minutes three times a week around the neighborhood and it feels good, okay? Try saying these things to yourself and see how there's a difference. You feel more on top of things, you feel like it's more possible. Now, when you do affirmations, usually you're doing affirmations because you're trying to change a habit, you're trying to change a way of thinking. It takes time. The important thing to remember is it can't be too big a jump, okay? So let's say that I am a really negative person, I'm a glass half empty person, and I wanna be a positive thinker. So if I'm starting out being a grouch, I'm not going to have an affirmation like I'm happy all the time because my mind is going to reject that. It's just too big. Okay, so the money example, if I haven't really been very good with money, I might not want to have a goal, you know, like I'm going to save $10,000 in three months because that's absurd. Or if I've just started exercising and I hope to run a marathon someday, I might, you know, say I'm, I'm exercising regularly more easily than ever. That might work better than, I just ran a marathon and feel great. Okay, so you have to make sure the gaps aren't too wide. Now when it comes to dealing with coping in a crisis, what are some good affirmations you might have? And I'll start with one. I will get through this. What are some other things? Instead of, you know, I hope I get through this. I will get through this. Or, I'm coping the best I can. I'm making the most of things. What are some others? Do any of you have any ideas of what you could say? Yes. This too shall pass. That's a wonderful affirmation. Because we know it always does. And if you can say that to yourself throughout the day, this too shall pass. It has very, a very calming effect. What are some other ones you might say in a crisis to get through it? Yes. 
Excellent. I've experienced down times before, and I'll get through this. Okay. Or maybe it's okay to set my own pace. That's a good one for every day. Or it's all right to reach out and ask for help. So whatever you have trouble with, I recommend that you flip it. So let's say that it's really, really hard for you to go at a pace that feels good. You know, um, try to flip that and start saying that to yourself because I'm finding it easier and easier to go at a, fa a pace that really feels right for me. Or I'm finding it easier and easier to stand up for myself and say no when I'm not feeling like doing something. Or I'm finding it easier to take care of my health. Whatever it might be for you. So, you know, I do whole day workshops on this. I don't have a lot of time, but I want you to leave here thinking about some of the things you'd like to change with your thinking and look at affirmations as a way to bring about new ways of thinking. Because as I said earlier, changing your thinking is really difficult. And when you're trying to change a thought, you know, these affirmations, they usually go really well when life is just clipping along and there's not a lot of stress, but when a crisis hits, you're going to go way back to the thinking that's been a problem for you. And the affirmations might not work, so be patient with it. And try to practice these affirmations, not just when there's a crisis, but all the time. Because like what I said about the grounding rituals, if it becomes a habit for you every day to look at your affirmations and say them to yourself, then when you're in crisis, it'll be much easier than if you just try them when you're feeling out of control. And I also recommend posting affirmations that you're working on in places where you'll see them, like on your mirror in the bathroom or on the refrigerator. Places that you know you'll look easily without having to work at it every day. So any questions about affirmations before we move on? Yes? That's great. So an affirmation that she has learned is to look in the mirror every day and say, I'm alive, I'm awake, and I feel great. And you may not feel great, but you're going to feel better if you say that. And if you remind yourself of what's going well, like even if you're really sick, you're still alive, right? You're still awake. Which brings to mind the idea of optimism. And I want to clarify this. I'm glad you brought this up. That we have a really twisted view in our culture of what optimism is. A lot of us think it's just deciding, I'm going to be happy all the time, I'm going to put on a smiley face and everything's going to be good. That's denial. Because it's not always really good. For, for anyone who's alive, you're going to have problems. It's not perfect. You're not going to be in a good mood all the time. Now, optimists tend to look at things in a way that is brighter than people who are pessimists. But the idea of optimism is not about not looking at what's wrong. It's about looking at the whole picture and saying, yeah, I have some problems here. I have myositis. Myositis is, is, is sucky. It's, it's horrible. I don't like it. I'm angry about it. However, there are some good things here. You know, like there's a lot of research being done in myositis. I know other people who have it, so I'm not alone. Um, maybe there are some benefits that have come, like maybe you've learned how to say, you need help more than ever. You know how to say no to people more than ever. You've made some friends as a result of this. Okay, it's, You'd rather not have it, but some good has come from it. So the idea of being an optimist is, is being, able, being able to look at the problem and say, yeah, something is really wrong here, but not stopping there and stepping back and saying, but what's good in the situation? So that even if you're feeling sick and you're looking in the mirror, you can say, you know, I feel terrible today, but I'm alive and I'm awake. And one of the best ways to stay positive overall is to put the emphasis on what you appreciate. And this works with everything. You know, for example, studies have been done on marriages and what makes marriages work best. And it's showing appreciation for your spouse every day through your actions and through your words. What makes people happier most of the time, as opposed to people who aren't happy, is appreciating yourself and your life. So what I do before I go to bed every night, I have a journal and I write three things in the journal. It's not hard to do. Three things that went well today. And some days it's hard because we all have bad days. So 
some days it might be, you know, I'm sitting there scratching my head. What, what is good today? Because the day was awful. Well, I have a bed to sleep in. I can breathe. My husband is next to me. My dog's on the floor on the other side. Life's not so bad. And I can tell you that doing that every night helps me to stay more focused and more positive. And it's not about denial. It's not about saying nothing's wrong. Again, it's about saying, yeah, sure, I have problems. But there's some good things, too. And when you focus on what's good, then you can start thinking about solutions and coping skills for what's wrong. Reach out for support. We all know this, but I can't say this enough. When you're really in crisis, especially when you're in crisis, you need to reach out for people. My sister-in-law, Susie, has a real tough time with this. Uh, Susie is the sort of person everybody gravitates towards. She's always been the person in our family who gives all the gifts and throws all the party and parties and offers all the advice. And she wants to be that person. She is that person. But she's had to really work hard at not being that person because it's so depleting for her. And she's really had to learn how to ask for help. And at first, when she was trying to do this, um, when her mindset is really starting to get bad, she really struggled with it. But now she sees that the more that she's able to ha have that help, the more she's able to be herself. When she has help from others, and she's able to be herself more, you know, that giving, that positive, that encouraging Susie. When she doesn't ask for support, she just starts to break down. And I've seen her life actually get bigger and better. I've seen a lot of growth take place with her, even though her disease is progressing internally. Um, she's growing and growing and growing because she's challenged herself in this way. So that's everything. I'm, I'm here to ask questions after we talk, but I just want to leave you with this one quote that I love, which relates to everything we've talked about today. This is from a book called When Things Fall Apart. Uh, it's written by Pima Chodron. I do recommend it. Uh, it's written from a Buddhism perspective, and it, it's from the perspective that there is no good or bad, there is no work-life balance. Um, Nothing is black and white. Life just is. And falling apart is just part of life. So the quote is this. We think that the point is to pass the test or to overcome the problem. But the truth is that things don't really get solved. They come together and they fall apart. Then they come together and they fall apart again. It's just like that. The healing comes from letting there be room for all this to happen. Room for grief, for relief for misery, for joy. And I, I really believe that this is true. If you can really adopt this principle and just allow everything to be, whether it feels horrible or feels wonderful, you'll feel more of a sense of control in a world where there is really no control at all. Thank you. And uh, again, I'll be here to answer any questions. Um,